Good morning, my name is Bill Clark and I'm the host of Scrambled Eggs and Ham. This morning I have a special guest, Richard Squires and Kate Simmons, and my co-host today is Don Maxwell Wade. So Scrambled Eggs and Ham is a weekly interview show focused upon the reinvention of the lives of each individual interviewee as, as a result of or impaired by life-changing illnesses that have now become a part of their daily existences. In each case, the interviewee has used his or her illness from strokes to neurological disorders, for example, as an impetus for personal growth. And this morning we have Richard uh, Squires from Life Story. And he's gonna, you know, I met Richard Squires at a, um, it was a walk, it was a stroll and roll walk. Is that correct, Richard? That's right, Kessler Stroll and Roll. Wow, yeah, it was a beautiful day. I was, I, it was a day actually I was struggling, but I managed to get through the whole walk, and I met some very interesting people, including you, yourself, Richard. So, Richard, when I stopped at your, your table, um, well, first of all, I'm going to ask a few questions of you, and then Don has some, and also Kate has some, some questions she wants to ask you about story. But, you know, it was pretty interesting. What intrigued me about your... Um, your vin, your vin was that you had a lot of books there, and I'm an avid reader. And I read some of the books, and it said life story, and I was wondering, wow, wow, well, is this about Richard's story? Uh, whose story is this about? <laughs> you know, and we talked about jazz, we talked about a lot of different music, because I noticed in your photo you have a guitar back there, and we talked about music a little bit. But can you tell us a little bit about your company, Life Story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and first of all, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here and to talk to you and, and your audience. Um, so I'm the owner of Life Story Memoir, and I, I write people's memoirs for them and uh, creates a tribute to a life. It's a legacy for a lifetime that families cherish for generations. And many of my clients are survivors of, of all kinds, um, whether they've survived wars or concentration camps in the Holocaust or accidents and disabilities. Um, or, you know, just uh, li large life changes. And uh, so I'm excited to be talking to your audience today, your listeners of survivors, and I, I applaud all of you. Um, and I feel that what I do makes a difference in people's lives because they're, you know, sharing their experiences and life lessons, their anecdotal stories, and, uh, and I think it's a helpful and therapeutic process. And it's beneficial to others also who may now be beginning a journey that you know well. Um, and many of my clients, you know, whether they're veterans or a lot of the seniors that I work with have dementia as well, mm -hmm. and their capacity to remember their journey and their stories, it starts to diminish. But, um, you know, they give me an account of their wonderful journey so we can share them for the future of their families and create a book that their families will always have. Wow. That's, I think the story is so important. And, you know, um, of course, we'll tell... As we speak on this podcast, we're telling a story and recording it, you know, which is amazing that we're, you know, this is going on and something that I can leave to my, my children and you can leave to your children and Don and and um, Kate can leave behind. Um, story is so important. You know, I love stories. I love great stories. One of the, one of the things I was looking at on your um, on your site was Orson Welles, 1984. <laughs> yeah. uh, Orwell. Yeah. yeah, Orwell, yeah. Yeah, I, I recently, right, I, I mentioned, I, I quoted Orwell in my recent newsletter, George Orwell, from, from, um, right, his most famous book is 1984, which is one of my favorite books. I mean, it's absolutely genius. Yes, and, it is. Yeah. 
I mean, what, what makes it so genius is, um, you know, you, and I used to teach this to my students when I was teaching writing and, and English, but you, um, you know, you think if someone were to, uh, you know, torture you and, you know, have, have you as a prisoner and, you know, try to convince you to say the opposite of what you believe, that you, in order to avoid the torture, you might say that, but you wouldn't actually believe it. Mm-hmm. But Orwell is able to dramatize um, actual brainwashing so that by the end you actually do believe the opposite of what you used to believe. Mm-hmm. Yes, I read 1984. I think it was an amazing book. Something else you yeah. talked about in your, uh, when, I was, when I was looking at your website, um, you talked about your clients range from the age from 20 to 100. Have you actually, have you talked to someone that was 100 or over? Yeah, so I, I recently did a book for a client who turned 100, and he had his 100th birthday party. His family came in from all over the country. We photographed it and put together a, a fantastic book. And this guy, Bob, he's a veteran of World War II. Really interesting story. He grew up with two deaf parents, and then he had a stroke not that long ago. Mm. And, and I'm hoping we're going to do a volume two of his story, which is because the first one was all about the party, um, which he said was the best time of his life. And I'm hoping to do, do you know, more of a uh, life story memoir where we can talk about his childhood with, you know, growing up with his deaf parents and um, time at war. But, um yeah, pretty great, right? Yeah. I don't, I, he's not the only client I've had that was 100. Wow, wow. you got to talk about that a little bit more. Listen, um, how, do you, how do you get people, how do you, how do you set your, your clients at ease? Because, you know, some people are ner- very nervous about sharing their story. How do you put them at ease so they can open up to you? Yeah, well, I think that that is one of the um, key traits that I bring to it that I, I think distinguishes me from other people and other interviewers is that I'm, I'm really good at uh, making people comfortable. I set a very comfortable atmosphere and people sort of, you know, we warm up. Even when it's someone who their family is nervous, that that's not going to happen. But I'm just, uh, I'm really easygoing. I am really curious. I ask a lot of questions and I'm legitimately interested in what people have to say and mm-hmm. in you know, just interested in people, and I and I think that they can pick up on that. And I'm very non-judgmental. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. And that... uh, I, I I just I set that tone. You know, and there's nothing that anyone can say that's wrong. Mm-hmm. And and also there's an editing process, so not everything has to be included. And sometimes people say things that um, you know, I'll edit it to help it be a little more diplomatic. And because I get a sense of the people who I'm interviewing, I, I really get a sense for them and their personalities and, and sort of what they want and what they want to communicate. So and, and so sometimes people say something and the words don't don't actually say exactly what they mean. Uh-huh. And I can so and I can take care of my clients. You know, I will change the words to make it so it more accurately communicates their meaning. And that happens even more so with people who you know, don't speak English as a first language. Wow. And I've interviewed a lot of Holocaust survivors. Wow. Um, that takes a lot of yeah. skill. That takes a lot of people skills, man. I, I applaud you for that. Kate has Thank some... You. Kate has... And um, Don has some questions for you. Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Can you hear you, you sound very quiet. Okay, hold on. Kate, are you still there? I am. Yes, I am. Okay, we're gonna uh, we're gonna come back to Don, Kate. Um, your your question. You had a great great question. Great. Well, welcome, Richard. We're glad to have you on this podcast. And my question for you is, how did you get started in this area? I see you um, you have a writing background and taught writing and still teach writing. So I'm curious, how did you get into doing life okay, Don, and you. the focus on memoir? Right. Well, it happened in a really organic way. Um, right, well, I, I grew up as, you know, always writing, loving stories, loving movies, writing poetry, and, you know, all of that. And I got two master's degrees in writing, and I used to do corporate communications uh, for some pharmaceutical companies. It was sort of my career at the time that I started to have my second master's degree, which was an MFA in fiction. And during that time, my grandfather asked me if I would write his memoir. And... And right away, um, 
it was a big light bulb moment for me because because I was like, yes, absolutely. Because I grew up listening to my grandfather tell stories. Um, he had been in World War II, and um, he told a lot of stories. But there was one story that I immediately thought of when he asked me if I would write his memoir because it was the one that was the most dramatic. Um, and, and this is the story, is that when he was 18 years old in World War II, he was in the U.S. Army Air Force. He was flying B-17 fighter planes in the Pacific. And, and on some missions, the enemy would launch these projectiles from the ground below, and they would explode and send out flak, which are shards of metal. And whatever they touched, if they hit the airplane, they, they sort of ripped that part of, that part of the airplane apart. And so during this one battle, the flak ripped off the floor of my grandfather's plane, and pieces went into his leg. Mm. And I can remember in my youth just, oh, like touching, running my fingers over those scars in his leg. They were like raised, sort of worm-shaped mm. kind of things. And he wow. told me about how he got hit in the leg, but his co-pilot got hit in the head, mm. and it killed his co-pilot. And so my grandfather, to save his own life, he had to think very quickly, and he bailed out of the airplane and parachuted down into the ocean. Um, it, it was so dramatic. And then when he was in the ocean, there were sharks there, and they were all very frightened that they were going to be eaten by the sharks. And they had these flotation devices that they blew up, which were also radios to call for help. They called the flotation devices Mae West after the um, the actress from the old days. <laughs> and um, thankfully, they were rescued. And so that was the story I thought of immediately. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like an aha moment. So when I interviewed him, he told me all about his adventures during war and then I was able to get a lot more very interesting information about his life um, about his his he was a competitive swimmer and would have gone to the Olympics if it wasn't for the war wow. and meeting my grandmother and falling in love he also his career was in the meat packing district in New York and one of his clients was the famous mafioso Paul Castellano oh so no kind of, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a funny story where he and my grandmother went out for dinner with Paul and his wife. And my grandmother had no clue what Paul Castellano did. And at the end, after the meal, she said, boy, those are the nicest people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, um, and then I just got to ask my grandfather all about his life and about, you know, getting married and raising his kids and becoming a grandfather. And then my grandfather, um, he had a stroke, basically. And uh, as as the book was printing, and at the very end of his life, I was able to tell him that we completed the book, and he mm -hmm. was amazingly happy about it, and we had this wow. special moment that was very comforting, mm -hmm. and and it was pretty, and and that's when I realized I had I had something here, yeah, you know, something I love to do in a, in a business, and we printed a lot of copies and gave them out to my cousins and all my family, and and it was just that was the beginning of my of the of my life story. Wow. That, I think that's a that's a great story, you know. Um, Richard, now Paul Castellano is not going to come after us now, is he? Well, he's long gone. Oh, but, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's got a uh, you know a couple generations later. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Don, Don, are Let's you? Hope not. <laughs> no, I'm yeah. just playing with. Are you still there? <laughs> yes, I, I'm back. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yep, I'm here. And you had a question for Richard. Uh, yes. I have a quick uh, question, Richard. Is there a genealogical component to these uh, stories? And what I'm, you know, I want to make sure that anyone listening understands the difference between their, um, their own story versus, you know, you can go back hundreds of years in terms of uh, your family history. And I know it's a very uh, nuanced difference, but I think it's a very important one because people have been, have seen um, the, 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 the gene, genealogical version on television for so long. Mm. Good question. Yeah, well, I love that you asked that because I do offer that as a component to the life stories that I make. Um, it's, uh, you know that that kind of information is outside of the scope of a person's you know lived life, but at the same time, I love hearing about the stories of people's elders because it tells you so much about their traditions and you know their values, where they came from, why they think what they think, um, you know how they were raised, and I, and I love 
like, you know, when I'm talking to a 100-year-old, and he can tell me stories about his grandparents who were born, you know, well before 1850, and, and even stories they might have told about their own grandparents. I mean, to me, that is, I, I love it, and I love the idea of co a comprehensive story. But I, I, but to speak, you know, also sort of specifically about genealogy, which has become a big thing these days, is I have genealogists that I work with, mm. and a couple of my clients have done this done these genealogy reports where they provide as much information as they can, what they know um, about their you know, previous generation's names, and those are breadcrumbs that the genealogist can then investigate. And in a book that I recently finished of a client who grew, he, he grew, spent his early life in Prague and then had to leave when he was seven years old in 1939 to avoid the Holocaust, the Nazis, and then grew up in New York City. But um, the genealogist was able to Un uncover information from his family going back to the early 1600s and dug up all these like manifests of birth certificates, uh, marriage certificates, death certificates, uh, ship manifests, all, all kinds of uh, amazing things. They, they had the addresses of where his uh, ancestors lived and what their jobs were. Mm. Wow. And uh, I, I love it. I love it. So it's not the same as you know, a person that, you know, kind of their own memoir within the scope of their own life. But I, th I think it, it, you know, says a lot about uh, just the, the, the ongoing story of the family, you know, the, the saga. Yeah, I think it's amazing. Right. I, I love to include that in the, in the memoir. Uh, okay, great. Uh, Kate, do you have another question for Ms. Richard? Well, I guess I'm just curious about Richard. So you've interviewed quite a few people. So my question is, what stories were the hardest for you to transcribe, and why? Okay. Uh, so one one that comes to mind is is my client Tom, who has Parkinson's, and I, I've have a number of clients who have Parkinson's, but it manifests in different ways. Um, the the one client I was talking about from Prague, he's. Uh, I've seen him decline over over the last year, year and a half. It's you know it's been clear, but he, I I still have no problem understanding him. He just speaks more slowly. Um, but this this client of mine, Tom, it was very hard to understand what he was saying, and his daughter had to be there uh, to translate a lot of what he was saying. So that that was probably the most difficult. Um, you know, when it comes to literally understanding what my client was saying. At the same time, we we communicated. He, he, even if I couldn't understand all his words, we, we became friends, and we did a lot of laughing, and his daughter played an important role in, in that, and we uh, had a lovely time, because that's really important to me, is that the the interviews are, are enjoyable, and very often we do a lot of laughing, and, and even some crying. Mm. Um, as far as... as other examples where the transcription can be difficult, the literal transcription, as, as opposed to the content um, of some of these stories, like, you know, I think of Holocaust survivors, but, um, you know, people who, who uh, don't speak English as a first language. Like, I, I have a, these, um, a married couple as clients right now, they're from China. They grew up during the Cultural Revolution under Mao Zedong, and uh, they were these city kids who then were forced to go out to the countryside to work with farmers, and it was just uh, all kinds of interesting stories around that. But, uh, you know, their English is not fantastic, and so it, it's harder to do the transcription. It takes more time. Wow. So because it has to be accurate for me, you know, before I can start editing their words. Wow. That's, one, that's great. That's wonderful, Don. Your question. My question uh, uh, was, was that the genealogical question. Okay. Or, um, was my main question. Okay. All right. She answered. Wonderful. All right. So, so Richard, then you are you're good with working with people in our community who had strokes or aneurysms or neurolog neurolog neural disorders. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I. Uh, yeah. I, I always find it very rewarding and, and welcome all, all you know opportunities like that um how do you how do you how do how do you apply that to your daily life how do i apply it to my daily life i, I guess i feel like i'm always well for, first of all you know as someone who loves story mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, the, the really compelling stories are the ones that are, are dramatic and full of conflict and challenge. Mm. You know, and, and they're rewarding, really rewarding, when they have, I don't know, not, not necessarily like a happy ending, but when you have a character who, and whether that's a fictional character or, or a real person, who shows the courage to, you know, face their their struggles and their challenges, and we all have them to some degree. Mm-hmm. But the greater the challenge, the the larger the conflict, the more rewarding the the payoff of the story. And that doesn't mean that you know it's like a fairy tale ending where you get to a point where you have absolutely no problems anymore, because that's not real life. Mm-hmm. But but I guess it's about you know it's about a character who shows who shows the courage and the, the fortitude and the perseverance to continue on and, you know, um, and, and express the values of, of, you know, trying to make the best life that you can for yourself and your family. Mm-hmm. So, so as, as far as for my own life, I'm always learning, always learning, mm-hmm. whether it's historical, you know, about history or uh, just about n- new examples of, of, you know, the 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 human soul and, and what we're all capable of when when we have to be. Mm-hmm. Wow. So are you writing your, your are you writing your own memoir? I I write when I'm not working on life story I'm writing fiction. Mm. But a lot of the fiction that I write is autobiographical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so it's, it's fiction but you know a lot of it's based on on my own life and I can take certain liberties more liberties. Oh, yes, of course, Richard. Yeah, what, yeah. Richard, what is your favorite drink of the day? My favorite drink. Yeah, of the day. Yeah. Depends on the time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love coffee. Well, I think it's important to start with a tall glass of water in the morning. Okay. Um, I do that. I have coffee, and then uh, I, you know, I, I like uh, my alcoholic beverages as well. I love good beer. I love IPA. I love uh-huh. gin. That was my my grandfather in. Ben, who who I wrote, he was the first memoir I did. He was yeah. big on beef eater gin. Okay. And so when I was growing up, that's what my dad and uncle and aunt were drinking, mm-hmm. and that's what I drink with my brothers. Mm-hmm. And it's just kind of the family drink. Wow! 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 So when we but talk, what about you? me What's um, your favorite drink? I, as a stroke survivor, <laughs> I just put the bottle there and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. That's about. Well, it's... water. Water is. You can never go wrong with water. Oh no, I, I do. Hey. I do juice. I do um, beet juice for my kidneys. I uh-huh. do. I do beet juice. I used to juice a lot. Apple beets, carrots was my favorite to juice. Um, I will at a at a basketball game or at a baseball game. I will have a beer. I will have. Yeah, a beer. It seems like a good time yeah. to do that. It's just part of the tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And plus, you know, I was approved. You know. I think I had this. Well, I had this experience where I had heart palpitations in the beginning when I had my when I was going through the, uh, my stroke years and years and years ago, and I didn't know how to stop it. Right, my heart palpitations. So I went and drank a bottle of wine, of good wine, <laughs> and it stopped it. And I told I told my doctor, right, my my cardiologist. I said, I said, well, how did you stop your heart? Why didn't you go to the emergency room? I said, no, I just went and got a bottle of wine and drank it, the whole thing, and it stopped. I felt fine the next day, you know. And he was just laughing. Yeah, well, you would think it would, re- it would relax your system. Yeah, yeah, red wine. It was great. It was, and it wasn't. It was um, it wasn't too expensive. It was like some just just instinct. Bill, grab the wine and. You know, stop these heart palpitations. But anyway, later on, I was able to, you know, get through that. Um, I do have a PFO, which is a patent form of Val Valley. If you ever heard of it, it's a hole in my heart. So, okay. So, um, you know, they close those surgically, either ro- robotics or open heart, one of the two. But I got I got through that along in 2010. Right. It's now right. 20, 2020. Um, Kate, do you have any more questions for Richard? Well, I guess I'm curious about the interview process. Do you prepare questions in advance for your clients? Do you have, um, do you lead workshops? Because uh, we do belong to brain injury support groups, and I'm sure some of your um, techniques might be a nice workshop um, or start people thinking about their memoir or their life. So when you're going to meet with a client, do you have an outline that you gear specifically for that client or a general outline? And how do you organize your memoir? 
great question. So, um, this is basically, um, I, when I'm having a consultation with a potential client, uh, I get enough information in our no fee, you know, conversation to get sort of a high level, broad idea of what their unique story is. And with that information, I put together a very high level outline um, that helps me estimate how many hours of interview I need to talk to the person for in order to put together the book that they're dreaming of. Um, and, and we can always, you know, decrease the amount of time we talk or add hours on. But I put together an outline there and I sort of break it up into its, its segments. And then, you know, and then I give that to the potential client with the proposal. And we sort of, we use that as, as a guide as we go through. I do show, I do have a binder full of questions and, you know, that I can always refer to if I need to. I, I pretty much never do. Hmm. Um, in, unless I have someone who's, a, you know, a, a difficult interview. And, you know, I can't think of anything else to ask, then I might go to my binder of questions. But, you know, generally it's, it's pretty free-flowing. I try to keep it chronological order. Um, the memoirs usually end up being chronological order, but they might, but, but not always. Sometimes they're thematic, you know, mm -hmm. where it's broken up um, into, say, segments like family and career, which both cover long periods of time and overlap. So sometimes they sort of... The, the, when you read the book, it'll go back and forth all according to time, or it might just be a career section and a, and a family section. Um, but that's, that's true. Yeah, does, does that answer the question okay? Yes, I guess I was wondering, yeah, how you cute or And how, do you decide what will be the focal point of the memoir, or is it a collaborative effort, you and your client? It's really collaborative. I, I mean, it's, it's really up to the client. You know, I, I get a sense of what the client has in mind from the conversations that we have before we even begin. Um, you know, you, it, it's so interesting what people, what memories people revisit um, more often than, than other memories. You know, like what takes the most real estate up in your, in your memory and in your mind and, you know, what parts of your life were so meaningful to you. You know, for some people, it, it's all about their career. They love their career. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I had a, a client, Al, um, who actually, it's interesting because his father had a stroke. And, you know, that played a huge role in, in his entire life, in Al's entire life. Um, because the, basically, Al was a, a career baker. Mm -hmm. And that's what he wanted to talk about. His focal point in his, in his story was that he was a baker. And he it created some items that he patented and he worked with some of the hugest bakeries and he also Frank Sinatra loved his his cheesecakes mm. so four <laughs> times a year Frank wow. Sinatra would have a party out in Los Angeles and my client Al would ship his cheesecakes out out to Frank so that was kind of a an exciting story but um Al wanted to talk about about baking when Al was young he was in ninth grade growing up in Brooklyn poor you know depression era time uh, his father had a stroke and couldn't work anymore. And so Al basically had a brother and a sister and a mother and a father who couldn't work, and Al went to work. So when he wasn't in school, he was working at the bakeries. And then when school finished, he was, he was working at the bakeries. And when he had an opportunity to try a, he was, he was a gifted baseball player. He had won some awards. He got an award from the mayor of New York uh, when he was young. And then when the, he had an opportunity to try out for the New York um, Giants baseball team before they moved out to San Francisco. And so one of the great stories is, is uh, one day after working all night, he went straight to Lodi, New Jersey, where he tried out for the, for the New York Giants. And after the first day, they invited him back to the second day. And he, he was a pitcher, and he went there, and he really performed well. He struck out some intimidating players. And they invited him to join the, the minor league team down in Alabama, but they could not offer him enough pay um, to compete with what he was making as, as a baker. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't be enough for him to be able to support his family, so he had to say no, he couldn't do it. And that was sort of um, really sad for him because he had to say no to his, his dream of playing professional baseball. But, but then on the bright side, and this was a connection we made during the interviews, is that he was exempt from the Korean War because he had to stay home and support his family. And if he had been playing baseball, he may have had to go to the war. 
Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. And I imagine you've learned a lot of life lessons from your interviews. So what are some of the life lessons that you've learned from your clients that maybe have impacted your life? I mean, kind of, I mean, the, the main thing, which I kind of already knew or, or felt, but it, it gets um, reinforced time and again, is that the more effort and care and, and love you put into your life, the more you're going to get out of it. Mm. Mm. You know, and that also, I mean, a lot of people had a lot of things in common. You know, when I mm. see people from Europe, they... A lot of people are talking about the, you know, similar places and similar historical events. Ah. Really interesting. Like I had a client who's, I had the client who grew up in Prague, and then I have another client whose mother was from, from Austria, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, who experienced the invasion of the Nazis from that point of view. Who, who grew up in a in a in a family that was very proud of their sort of Austria-German heritage and was very excited when the Germans were, were coming in to like take back uh, an area that they had lost uh, to, to another nationality because cause the, I, I'm, I can't remember the, the details right now, but the borders were always changing. And before they knew how evil the Germans were, they were, they were happy. Um, so it, it's kind of a lot of like overlapping stories in, in history. Hmm. I, so, uh, you know, I learn a lot about history. I don't know if that's exactly a lesson, but uh, I, the ma- I guess the main thing is love of family and love of story. Yeah, yeah. Definitely is a lesson. That's definitely Yeah. It. How did you come up with the name Life Story? Um, just throwing a lot of ideas out, Life Story. I don't know, it kind of came to me organically. Uh-huh. Yeah, I remember brainstorming, you know, quite a few things. I think I came up with Life Story kind of early in the brainstorming process, but then, you know, as a writer, you never want to go with the first thing that comes to you mm. because that's that's the thing that kind of offers itself up automatically, and it might be a cliche. It might not be something you actually invented. It might be something that your subconscious mm-hmm. pulled from, from culture or from, you know, something you saw on TV. Mm-hmm. You want to take the time to come up with, to dig a little deeper, and, and come up with more things so that you can pick, you know, the best choice that you have out of what you came up with. Mm. Um, w- which is why when I'm interviewing people, it's, you know, it's never just the first story that they tell me. I, w- I want to dig down and, and make the connections and try People always, when, during the interviews, they always think of things they haven't thought about in years. Mm. Because once you start talking about it, it's like the process of writing. You can kind of stumble onto new things that you haven't thought about or couldn't have thought about it until you started talking about them or, or writing about them. Mm-hmm. So, so anyway, I can't try to came up with a lot of ideas, and I thought Life Story was a good one. Yeah, I think it's a great, it's a great, it's a great name for, for, for what you. you do. Yeah. It's how, how did you guys come up with uh, scrambled eggs and ham? Oh, how did I come up with scrambled scrambled egg? Oh, I'll tell you. I think I told this story before on on the air many times, but I I'll share a little bit with you. Um, it's as a you, great story. <laughs> it's a great story, Don says. Well, <laughs> how I came up with scrambled eggs and ham um, was when I had my stroke. Um, you know, um, I was in a support group because, you know, I think, you know, maybe you had some stories about that with some of your clients. When you come out of a stroke, you get, you know, therapy, you know, all kinds of therapy, cognitive therapy, group therapy, neural therapy, this therapy, all kinds of therapy, you know, we got. And, um, you know, like a lot of people kind of felt in the group that their eggs, sometimes they didn't have so much hope, Richard, you know. And the, yeah. the, the cliche is, oh, your egg is fried. You have a fried egg, you know. Your egg is fried. You're, you're cooked, right? So I thought about that for years. This was back in about two, um, 2011. I thought about a podcast back then, and I was going to call it fried egg. But fried eggs means your egg, you know, your brain is fried. It's not so compassionate. It's not a compassionate thing for me. To say you have a your egg is fried, your brain is fried, you're you know you're throwaway because some people felt that they were throw being thrown away. They were burdens to their family. I'm sure you heard that in your stories. Sure, yeah. You, you know, but how I came up with scrambled eggs is I used to try to make breakfast for myself, Richard, 
my wife would go off with the kids. You know, I, I could no longer take the kids to school, drop them off, and my wife would go to work and she'd take the kids and I'd be home alone by myself. And I would try to make breathics for myself. And I'd always end up catching, setting the kitchen on fire. It happened about seven times approximately. Wow. You know, because as a stroke, you forget things, you know, I even forgot my son's name and I, I named him. You know, I named my son. I, didn't, I knew there was a kid walking around the house. I didn't know his name, you know, after the stroke. But um, that's, I'm so much better now. But I kept burning up the house, man. Like, I tried to make scrambled eggs, you know, fried eggs and ham. And I walk away and do something else. And then the kitchen, the, the kitchen would catch on fire. The pots would burn up. I'd run, I'd smell the smoke. And I'd run downstairs and I'd try to put the fire out. So this happened about seven times. And the kitchen was, was always smelling like smoke, and uh, we were always replacing the pots and pans with new, new pots. So one day, my wife was looking, you know, we weren't on a good terms at that time. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And she was looking through some paperwork, and she was looking and, um, and you know, researching things online. And I said, you know what? She must be looking for a lawyer. She's tired of this guy. You know, she married me and I'm burning up the kitchen and setting the kitchen on fire and I had a stroke and I'm a different person. She's going to call. She's going to divorce me. So that's the story. And then I got into NJIT to do software engineering. So I was uh -huh. accepted in there, even though I had a brain injury. I fought like hell, passed the tests and I got in. And this is a second a second degree. It's not my first degree. And I and one day my professor at NGIT, his name was uh, Kellers. He said, "Will like why you know what's going on? What's going on?" We had a heart to heart talk. He said, "What's going on in your life? What's going on?" You know, because we had a small lab. Everybody in um, this engineering class or or uh, program had a brain injury or a stroke or aneurysm, and they were trying trying to get through it. You know. And he asked me, and we had a heart to heart. And he said, I told him, I said, you know, my wife is going to divorce me because I keep burning up the kitchen. And he looks at me and he says, Willie, you know, he says, Bill, have you ever heard of cereal? Why are you trying? Why are you trying to cook for yourself? And I said, yeah, man, you know, so I tried cereal. And I was I stopped cooking for myself for a while, for years. And I, I just start making cereal, Richard, and we're still married 37 years. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. <laughs> that's great. You know, the things we do for love. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had to, you know, coming from um, then, you know, Kate can probably re, um, add to this and Don can add to this. But being in um, dealing with those type of events in your life where you don't know things have changed so so much from from the day before and you're trying to um, develop devices or you're trying to develop some way to get you through the day you know um, some type of um, support some something to help you remember what you're doing at the end of the day what you want to achieve you know it's a it's very it can be a very difficult task and it is a difficult task however I looked at it as a sense of mission I look at scrambled eggs and ham as a sense of mission because scrambled eggs is not so bad, it's not so harsh as fried egg. And the scrambled eggs, Richard, you can put sausage, you can put tomatoes, you can put onions, you can put, you can mix a lot of things in there to make it taste real good, right? So that's what I did. Now when I make scrambled eggs, I don't burn the kitchen up. I haven't done that in years and years and years. And it tastes really good. I put mushrooms in there, you know. So that's why I call the podcast Scramble Eggs. Because it's, it's not just about um, people who had this event. But it's about everyone. You know, it's about everybody, everyone who's who's um, had this, this, you know, event in their lives. And who has a support group. Some people don't have a support group. You know, they're out there on their own. And trying to face the world with this um, this thing. And, and trying to... Um, make sense of it you know their next step how do they live now but I think Don and Kate can also add something to it well I, I love that um, 
such an interesting. Uh, just, just to kind of, sorry, sorry, Don and, and Kate, I, I just kind of want to respond real quick. Um, first of all, I also had scrambled eggs this morning with mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> and tomatoes. That's that's what I have many mornings. Um, the sto- I, I love how the story, um, you know, you made a decision to change what you were doing. You wanted to make fried eggs, but... Um, you you made a change, uh, you know, for your wife it, to for her, you know. Sorry, it, it's kind of a, a very giving story. It's like a kind. Of, it kind of symbolizes um, giving something up on on your end to make her happy, which which pays off great dividends because you're still married. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are. Love that. We're still walking in the park after dark. Amazing, right? It's amazing. Mm-hmm. She's she's really incredible. She's an incredible person and incredible caregiver. You know, and also my children, you know, they were very small at the time when I had my event and they were just like, you know, wow, dad's different. You know, he doesn't take us fishing anymore. He doesn't go to the soccer game. Why? Why is he sitting there staring at at the, at the, you know, this is the beginning of my event. Now I'm swimming, playing basketball, boxing, everything, riding a bike with the kids you know, beating them at basketball, it's, it's you know, I've come a long way. And I'm sure that um, Don and Kate can also reiterate, reiterate, reiterate on that struggle. Right, Kate? Because yeah. she's uh, yeah. writing a memoir. Actually, I think Kate is writing... Yes. What's the name of your memoir, by the way? So the memoir is titled, tentatively, It's Okay If Your Shoe Falls Off and Other Lessons I Learned from Being Paralyzed and Speechless. So it's it's all about, um, yeah, I had encephalitis and meningitis, and uh, as I got better, certain things just still didn't work right. And it's interesting hearing your story, Bill, about the kitchen. I had forgot that mine was similar, but luckily I had a bird at the time. We had a love bird who actually we would let the cage door be open, mm-hmm. and she really didn't fly that much, but she would walk around. So actually I would leave the tea water on, mm-hmm. and, you know, a tea kettle, it would whistle. I just yes. couldn't hear it. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with my hearing, but my brain did not make that connection. Mm-hmm. That bird would squawk, leave her cage. She would find me wherever I was in the apartment, and she would just make such commotion. I said, well, what's wrong with you, bird? And sure enough, I was burning down the house or trying to. Just, <laughs> this is, and I think, you know, hearing that story, Mike, makes me wonder how many other people that have had a stroke or other brain injury had a similar incident where we don't keep track of things, you know, that things, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if, if Don has a similar experience where you, you leave things on the stove or um, other things take precedence. Luckily, luckily I didn't leave anything on the stove. But what I do take away from that story every single time Bill t- tells it to me is that things that you become, um, that become second nature, all of a sudden, to- you ha- totally have to relearn it. And that is the scary part. Um, my, I feel, you know, many people explain to me that I sounded different. And I, and literally I was like, what are they talking about? And you can't see the differences in yourself, but everybody else can see the differences. So you need to become cognizant of that and change your life to address those um, changes mm-hmm. yes yeah you have mm-hmm. to you have to you have to come cognizant of it because like I wasn't in the beginning I, you know I was like just hanging out you know and um, and I, I, I what I was doing was but I was chanting five hours a day and Richard I chant Nam Yo and Get Kyo and so does Don and um, we're Buddhists and that really, you know, my I had a support group at Kessler, but I really had really incredible support from my Buddhist family. You know, um, we chanting, you know, praying and chanting for my health. Yeah. Oh, that that's beautiful. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that when we met, and, and I remember looking it up actually doing an internet search. I mean, it, it looks, you know, lovely. Uh, very sort of musical, right? You kind of. I had the impression you kind of sink into a, a very meditative, peaceful, um, you know, vibe that comes from from those syllables. Mm. You know, the, the way that, the way that when you're singing, 
the right note, you can you just feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, you you're in rhythm with the universe. You know, you become in rhythm with the mystic law of cause and effect. You know, so Nam means devotion to the mystic law of cause and effect, and um, you become in You know, you you attract those people the po positive people in your orbit it's like incredible i've been practicing for like 30 34 years now and actually i met Dom, my wife through the practice you know um which is another story um you know another podcast <laughs> you know what i mean but but um uh, kate do you have another question for richard no, I, I appreciate um, what you're doing. I think it's an important work, um, helping people get in touch with their own stories, and especially people um, that have had a traumatic uh, experience uh, and even coming towards the end of life. And I think it's just wonderful that you're using your talents of being a writer and being a great listener to captivate and record their stories and turn it into something beautiful. So thank you, Richard, for you know being on this podcast and for sharing your gifts and talents. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and you know, I really love what I do because it's it's very meaningful to to my clients. You know, it really goes to the heart, and it's meaningful to me because you know we bond. But you know what what the clients end up with for their families, and it it goes deep to their heart. And, and when you were kind of asking, I mean, I, I'm having you know this is such an interesting conversation. I'm having a lot of thoughts, but um. You know, th there was a question before about, um, let me know if I'm going on too long, if you're trying to, I don't know, wrap up, but, but um, y you know, like, like who, who decides on the general thrust or overall story of the, you know, the person's memoir, and it's, you know, it comes out of the, out of the life that's lived by the person, so, so, um, Bill, you know, the, the, uh, just the chapter of meeting your wife through what you do with the Buddhist practice would would absolutely be there. I mean, it's there's no way around that, mm -hmm. right? Because that's such an important part. Mm, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think that it was a, it, it was definitely um, you know, um, and Richard, you're married. I think I met your wife. Did I meet her? At the no, she, I don't think she was there that day. Okay, all right. No, okay, uh, all right. Um, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. There was, but there was there was a young lady there at the, at the booth with you. Oh, 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 you're talking about my, uh, the uh, lady who used to be my assistant. Yes, that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, Richard, I enjoy it. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, man. I learned so much from you, you know? And, and what I, what, if I might interrupt you real quick, what I like about this, Richard, is that just talking about this illuminate so much so many similarities and things in each person's life they may not have even thought about it as being part of their um healing process mm, right that's right it is part of that great 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 observation don it is you know journaling and, and telling your story and being able to hold that up and take a look at where you were then and how you how life, you know, how you moved your life ahead. I think that's incredible, man. That's some that's some incredible stuff. Richard, how can people get in contact with you? So you can visit my website, which is www.lifestorymemoir.com. You can email me, richard at lifestorymemoir.com. And you can also call me. My number is 973-903-1487. I would love to hear from you and learn your story. There is no shortage of unique stories in this world, mm. and they are all important. Yes, they are. They are. Kate, you still there? Yes, I am. And so you I, have you have one I, of the last words. Was, <laughs> the one last word. Well, thank you. I just thank you all. First, thank you, Bill, for having this podcast. I think it's an important service to anyone that has a brain injury or other people that are learning to come to terms with their life, their new life. And I thank you for hosting this and also for Don. And thank also thank Richard for being our guest today. I think uh, it was really fantastic to hear the service he's providing and the good he's doing in this world. So thank you. Thank you all. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you all. Thank, thank you so much. Okay. All righty. So, um, th uh, you know, 
Richard, it's always, I'm going to contact you a little later. Um, and Don's going to contact you. And, and I think Kate might have some more questions for you a little later. But thank you know, thank, I want to, first of all, um, what I want to do is thank everybody for being on here this morning. And, um, and Richard, again, thank you. Kate, thank you. Don, thank you. And the listeners, thank you for joining us today. My sincere prayers are for your health and your happiness and that you live out your lives to the fullest. Thanks, everybody, again, for being on it. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Kate. Yep.